So we're talking about human performance improvement as ASTD, now ATD, branded it. But before ATD grabbed a hold of this notion of human performance improvement, it was known as human performance technology at my professional uh, organization, my professional home, NSPI, which is now ISPI, the International Society for Performance Improvement. You might want to take a look at their website and their offerings and things like that, because that's really the home of human performance technology, which is the means to the ends of human performance improvement. Now, this all started by a group of people who were very involved in programmed instruction back in the early 60s. NSPI, ISPI started in 1962, and it was the home of programmed instruction, and that became pro performance-based programmed instruction, unless it was in for the educational world. But in an enterprise or corporate training, as it used to be called, this is the focus on helping people to perform their jobs. Now, so one of the things, and you'll see in the little bubbles there, uh, it's more than learning and development or training and development or instruction. Uh, I'm an old guy. I've, I've been around in this business for almost 44 years. And so I tend to call these things instruction or training and development because that's how I grew up in the business. The word human was added to this because all performance is a human endeavor. Um, and But before it was called HPT, it was simply called PT, performance technology. And so there's a lot of competing language for the same notions, and that makes it somewhat confusing, and I apologize for that. So I look at HPT as beyond, but including instruction or training or learning. So the focus from my perspective is that L&D should always be, or almost always be, focused on performance. Yet we get a lot of requests for content on topics or knowledge. Skills is a really big deal now. It used to be behaviors back in the uh, 70s and 80s, and then it became competencies. That was the focus. But now we're on this skills mania track where everybody's wanting to skill or reskill or upskill people. But those are really just means to the ends of performance. And if we look at a performance context, there's a chain of cognitive and behavioral tasks that are performed by people in order to produce outputs that become inputs downstream. For me, people are on the payroll not to know stuff, but to do stuff to perform, to produce outputs that become inputs downstream and that the outputs and the tasks that are performed uh, meet stakeholder requirements. So, and that leads to good outcomes. And when we don't meet stakeholder requirements, that needs, leads to not so good outcomes. I take a systems view. I was taught this back in 1979 that we needed to think uh, systemically about performance, and we need to look at it at the people level, and people work in processes, and processes are part of organizations, and all of that feeds a value chain for each of our enterprises. And my model for looking at all of the variables of performance are what I call the epi fishbone diagram, and I'll talk a little bit about this. This was adapted from the Ishikawa diagram and Tom Gilbert's uh, behavior engineering model, and I'll co cover a little bit of that. So it, it, my approach to this comes a little bit out of the total quality management movement world and the HPT, human performance technology world. We, of course, are looking at supporting and enabling people via awareness, knowledge, and skills development. But there's many, many other variables that help people perform, help processes perform, help our organizations perform. Now, I generated this next this part here by BARD, Google's BARD, Artificial Intelligence uh, Generative AI. And uh, so I don't take any responsibilities for errors of fact or omission. But, but it did say that my philosophies were these five bullet points here. And I only take exception to the third bullet there. And 
L&D should be learner slash performer centered or centric. It is not about learners for the sake of learning. It's about learners learning for the sake of performance, the ability to perform tasks, to produce outputs to stakeholder requirements. And so this is my little model. This is what I call performance competence, could have been called performance capabilities or many other labels, but I borrowed the term competence because one of my mentors back from 1979, the late Tom Gilbert, wrote a book in 1978 about human competence. And he bemoaned the cult of behaviors where we were all focused on behaviors, but we didn't understand the terminal outputs that people were trying to produce with those behaviors. So I'm, and we do the same thing with skills and competencies and all that. They're always out of context or, or not in context often enough for my satisfaction. But so stakeholders are a key part of this. And my little model on the right there is just an example, but there's society at large, you know, we do things in either society at large agrees with it. The government has laws, regulation codes that we must comply with. Our owners and shareholders want things. The board of directors there to represent the interests of the shareholders. There's executives, management, customers, employees, suppliers, and the community at large. And these are all the stakeholders and they might have similar requirements or competing requirements. And I put this into a hierarchy for an article in a quality journal back in 95, because my clients at the time were struggling with the fact that they had competing requirements from different stakeholders. And they didn't know which ones to listen to and which ones to forego. And so I constructed this article to help them figure out in a case by case situation here. And here's just an example, you know, who wins if the if the conf if there's conflict in the requirements well there's a hierarchy here and i don't care what your customer wants if the government will throw you in jail and fine you millions and millions and millions of dollars or whatever uh, currency um they're going to win so the customer is not king is not always right and that was the uh, subtitle to the article that i had written so Performance competence, the ability to perform tasks to produce outputs to stakeholder requirements happens at the individual level. This is why I like my definition because it works at the individual level, but it also works at the process level. The process performs tasks to produce outputs to stakeholder requirements. The organizations do the same thing. And our entire value chain as an enterprise where we fit into a larger value chain. And if you're producing pharmaceuticals, they go into a distribution network that you probably don't own. I'm not sure if you do or not. But but so you're, you're part of something that's much bigger and we need to begin to understand that. That's the intent of human performance technology or performance technology is understanding all of that. The roots of HPT go way back. Now this was my, one of my key mentors, the late Gary Rumler, he was a business partner uh, for a decade with Tom Gilbert. And Tom Gilbert was known as the father of human performance technology. That was quite controversial when somebody deemed him that back in the mid 90s, because a lot of people would have thought it's this guy, Gary Rumler. But what Gary said is that th all the roots of human performance technology or performance technology were formed back in the 60s. And there's really not been a lot new since 1970s. And you talk about skills and we talk about all sorts of things, engagement, being learner centric, all of that was known and talked about back in the 60s. Yet a lot of these things weren't published because we didn't have the ability to distribute that kind of information then. And you'd have to go to individual workshops and such, walk away with your three inch binder and you would have this kind of content but it wasn't generally available to the public. Now, I got my source for all of these kinds of things because of my professional affiliation with NSPI, which is now again, ISPI, as I've said. But so the word human was added to performance technology in the mid to early, uh, early to mid 1990s. And it's been somewhat of a controversy, but the pushback on people who thought that that shouldn't be added, they just said, well, all performance is a human endeavor. We invent bulldozers uh, to help humans perform. Um, we invent elevators to help humans perform. So performance includes both the outputs and the tasks and the entire environment or context that 
performance happens within. And when you take a systems view and you're looking at a value chain, that's quite complex. Or if we narrow it down to an individual on the manufacturing line in a pharmaceutical manufacturing site, we can look at something much more narrower. But that individual is part of a larger context. Things are happening upstream, as the quality people might talk about it, and things are happening downstream. And we can't just look at something in isolation and not understand the broader context for things. Technology is a funny word. Back when I started in 1979, technology meant the application of science, not computer and digital stuff. And today, when you talk about technology, most people are thinking that you're talking about computers and digital technologies, et cetera. But technology really is the application of science. And so HPT, the T is about the application of science for improving performance of humans in whatever processes, organizations, and value chains that they work in. Now, again, this was very controversial. So there was this movement at NSPI, ISPI for people who were saying, get the H out, which is kind of a joke, you know, get the hell out. But so they wanted the H off because it, they felt that it, it focused us uh, inappropriately on what might be called human re uh, relations, human resources, uh, the personnel organizations. And HPT is broader than that, um, but yet all human is a performance endeavor. So this is quite controversial. So you, there are people within my professional networks who would just call it performance improvement and not human performance improvement, or they call it performance technology and not human performance technology. This just makes it very difficult for people climbing the learning and performance curves to get their arms around this and begin to understand it and begin to use it. Many, many names. I could have put three, four, five, six, seven dozen additional names on this slide here about many HPT practitioners, both past and present. Some of these people are no longer with us. Um, and a warning here is that not all self-proclaimed performance consultants look beyond knowledge and skills. Uh, this is an issue that uh, bothers me, quite frankly, and that performance uh, uh, consultants used to look at all of the variables, but then it started being watered down to look at just what are the knowledge and skill variables. But again, there's more variables to performance than just knowledge and skills. And Joe Harless in the mid 80s said, and, and he's one of the gurus, he was a student of Tom Gilbert's. He gets confused when people that are call themselves performance technologists, see that was the term back in the mid 80s, uh, but they always produce training or information or education type products for every project that they're involved in. And that kind of suggests that they're not really performance consultants or performance technologists, they're instruction, training, or learning technologists at the best. In 1993, my two business partners and I wrote this book, The Quality Roadmap, and it was our approach to blending total quality management, TQM, with human performance technology, HBT. Um, but the, some of the roots of this go back to Tom Gilbert's behavior engineering model. This is very famous. It's sometimes known as the six box model. One of my friends, colleagues in, in, in SBI, ISBI, Carl Binder, uh, made this more user friendly with different language than Gilbert used in his 1978 book, Human Competence. And this is these are the six boxes. So you can see there's environmental aspects and there's the person's repertoire of behavior, as he called it. Well, on the page before this in that book, there was the behavior model for creating incompetence. So we used to hand this book out to our clients as consulting group back in the early 80s. And I always like to show my clients this page before I showed them the behavior engineering model, because they would look at this and go, okay, yeah, we that we do that. Oh yeah, we do that and that and that. Oh, we do all of, we're creating incompetence. And they we could laugh about this. And then we'd look at the behavior engineering model that suggested or told you what you might need to do. And so don't tell, let people know how well they are performing or leaving training to chance. That's how we can create incompetence, not deliberately, but inadvertently because we're not paying attention to 
what's required. Then in, I worked at uh, in 1981 and 1982 at Motorola, and I supported manufacturing materials and purchasing organizations. And I came across this Ishikawa diagram, also known as the fishbone diagram or the cause and effect diagram. But it was big in the quality movement back in Japan and in America um, as quality circles uh, teams w address quality problems and sometimes opportunities, but mostly problems. To diagnose a problem, you'd look at the 4M model, the men, materials, methods, and machines for any process and try to figure out, well, what is not uh, adequate to the needs of the process? Well, this was, uh, this was an epiphany for me to look at the, how the total quality management uh, movement looked at performance, and I had been looking at it through an HPT lens. And so this was very helpful. So uh, back in the 80s, I merged and morphed and <laughs> all of these things into my model, which is just uh, suggests here are the variables as Guy Wallace looks at them. There's many competing models for this. So if you really get into this, you might need to really look at uh, more than just what I'm sharing with you here today. But to me, processes are all about the inputs and the outputs and the tasks within and the process box, but there are all these human enablers and environmental enablers. And uh, I'm not gonna go through this in great detail. Uh, you can look at this later on, but, uh, but so this is how I help my clients understand when I'm looking at training or instruction or learning, what is really needed in the process. So I believe that uh, there's a lot of pushback uh, in the field about, you know, don't be an order taker. Well, that's nonsense. We are a service organization. We should take an order and agree to conduct a project, not necessarily guarantee and agree to produce L&D, because we might find out that L&D is not going to solve anything, and it would be a waste of shareholder equity with negative or nil return, and we should be looking and helping our clients uh, improve performance for a significant return on their investments. So I believe in take the order, plan and conduct the effort, uh, take the client and the stakeholders along on the journey as partners, because it's, they live with the consequences as to whether or not we do good L&D or not. Not us, they do. They're the stakeholders. And we need to take back to them at the L&D pivot point at the end of analysis phase, valid and credible data to help them make a better business decision as to whether or not to continue with learning or to pivot to some other non-instructional interventions or to do both. So my six-phase model there is an adaptation of ADDI, if you're familiar with that, analysis, design, development, implementation, and evaluation. But this is the model, the framework that I've used for project planning and management since I became a consultant in 1982. So in the first phase, we're doing an intake process. We get a request. We need to clarify the request, make sure we understand you know, why is the client coming to us, the requester coming to us? We need to do an adequate level of project planning so that we can say, well, this is what it's gonna cost. These are the resources we need in order to do this. This is the schedule. These are the key milestone dates. Whatever language you use in your uh, company is the language you should be using. Convert all this uh, L&D jargon to uh, the jargon of your uh, enterprise. And then I do a kickoff with the project steering team because they live with the consequences. I want to say, here's what I understand about your request. Here's the plan to go forward. These are the resources I'm going to need. People, I may need to uh, observe things, but are, you know, if you want to do this, this is the plan and this is the burden and expectations on the client side, the customer side. We on the supply side could do this project for you, but we're going to have to collaborate and cooperate in order to get it done well. And then when we go into doing analysis, we need to understand our target audience. We need to look at the performance and the gaps of performance. And we need to look at what are the enabling knowledge and skills that allow people to perform. And then we can look at existing content and assess it for its reuse potential. This was a big deal for me because I had supported Motorola in manufacturing and they were reusing uh, sub-assemblies and 
uh, components and piece parts on various products to reduce their inventories. And so this was important to me that I figure out how to approach learning and development or training and development, sharing content appropriately, either as is or after modification. So I might have different versions of active listening for the different target audiences so that it would be authentic to their performance requirements, but there might've been a core of active listening that was shareable across all my target audiences. But the practice exercises would have to vary because everybody's use of active listening might be slightly different. And we're trying to create learning for near transfer where the content that we produced was authentic to the target audience and didn't feel like it was for somebody else's job. In design, I do modular events with modular lessons, with modular instructional activities. And those are either information, demonstration, or application exercises, infos, demos, and appos. And so I would take my analysis data and organize it this way. And this again is kind of a manufacturing look uh, for uh, products, sub-assemblies, and component parts within those things. And this is just my method for doing instructional design. When I go into development and acquisition, I create the first drafts of content and then I test them. And I call those alpha tests. Uh, then I do the second, and which I call beta versions, and I test those and I review those with people and update them to create pilot test drafts because my next phase in my methodology, pilot test, is where I conduct a full destructive pilot test. Now, I've extracted pilot testing from most people's view of the development phase because I wanted to make a big deal about it to my clients and stakeholders. Yeah, we're gonna create this content, but then we're gonna test it. We're gonna test the heck out of it. We're gonna try to break it and see if it's good enough to deploy. And if it's not, we're gonna fix it. But now we really need to have the right resources. And what I was asking from them to support me in this pilot test were target audience members. Yeah, I wanna see if learning occurs if we've actually helped people learn the right kinds of things, the right knowledge, the right skills, the right capabilities to perform. And I can only do that if you give me the typical target audience members and we'll put them through the, basically the first uh, session uh, for this learning, well, however it's being deployed, self-paced, coached, or group-paced. But I need target audience me members so I can measure learning to make sure that this actually does that job. But they can't, the target audience, while I can measure learning with them, they can't tell me with what, whether what they learned was accurate, complete, and appropriate. So I'm going to need in my full destructive pilot test master performers and other subject matter experts. I need to have them take a look at this. I always have them participate as participants, learners, students, if you will, in the learning so that they go through it so they can't just sit back and go, okay, I, I think it's okay or I don't like. No, I put them into the seat and they do everything that the learners will do. They get that full experience and then they can help me determine whether or not what we put in place is accurate, complete, and appropriate. And I can't measure learning with this group because theoretically they already know, but they can. But so I need these two kinds of audiences when I'm doing my full destructive pilot test. Then I review the results with the project steering team. That's what these little upside down traffic lights are in this model. It's the gate review meeting, a term borrowed from the quality movement, to meet with the client and the stakeholders to say, here's what we've got so far, here's where we're going next. Well, what we would tell the project steering team in this is, Here's the results, the feedback from the pilot session. Here's our revision recommendations. And if you approve them, they'll become our revision specifications. And we'll go into the next phase and revise the content. If necessary, we'll repilot. That's a client decision, I think. And then we will release it to whatever deployment and access systems we have in place. And that's where the implementation and evaluation and maintenance happens, which is kind of part of the uh, traditional ADDIE model that I've adapted my model from. 
So this is all about making sure that we're focused on performance. We understand who the stakeholders are for performance and what they require for both tasks and outputs. So we can make sure that when we train people, when we provide them with learning, that that's what they're learning how to do. And we want to then look at what are the enabling knowledge and skills. I'll cover this in a little bit more detail in a moment. And we need to do this target audience analysis. Who are they coming? What job assignments do they really have? They may all have the same job title, but maybe the assignments that they get vary. And so people with the same job title may do different things from other people with the same job title. And then we want to know what are their typical incoming knowledge and skills from education and experience and how might that affect how we might modularize our content so we can help people avoid what they don't need because it's not part of their jobs or avoid what they already know. That was my goal. So I want to take you back now through the analysis phase and how I look at performance and enabling knowledge and skills. This is based on a project I did with Eli Lilly back in 2004, and they had done a Six Sigma effort for their corporation for their global clinical trials processes. So how do you do clinical trials here globally? And what's the same everywhere and where does it vary? So they had that data, but my client who had had some experience with me um, brought me in to take all this data and extend it. And so what the first thing we do is we frame the performance with what I call areas of performance or major duties or key results areas, lots of different language for this. And we produce performance models. And we'll look at one of these in just a moment here in a little bit more detail. And that tells us about the outputs and the measures and the tasks and the various roles and responsibilities and does a gap analysis against that. Um, and then we go from there. Now, when I train people, and I've trained people in my methodologies here at AT&T and Amico and Eli Lilly, General Motors, Hewlett Packard, and Siemens Building Technologies, and when I teach them, I say, you're going after ideal performance. What are master performers doing? That's ideal. We need everybody else to perform at their level. Here's a set of questions that I would use in analysis. But in my training, I would tell my students that, okay, you can't use these questions. These are guys questions. You need to come up with your own because you have to learn how to ask your questions more than one way so that you're, if your question doesn't resonate with the person you're asking, you might have to ask it in a slightly different way so they understand what you're really looking for. But so these, these are the questions, the starter questions for ideal performance analysis. And then when you're looking at a gap analysis, these are the other questions. Again, I'm going to be sharing the PowerPoint show with you. You can go back and look at this in detail. And this is all over my website and uh, books that I've written, et cetera. So you'll need to learn how to adapt and uh, adopt or adapt these questions as needed to make sure that they work for you. So this is one page of a performance model. This is how I document the ideal and the gaps of performance. I want to know what the key outputs are, how they're measured in the real world by stakeholders, whoever those stakeholders might be. What are the tasks that relate to each output? What are the various roles and responsibilities? Who's doing what in the uh, task performance? Are we have people executing the tasks? Do we have other people reviewing the tasks? Do we have other people giving input to the tasks? You know, there's a variance here in terms of who are the players in the sandbox of performance and how does this all work? Who's doing what? And then I want to understand what are the typical performance gaps where outputs and the measures aren't being met? That's how I focus in on the gaps. Where are the outputs not adequate? And what measures are they missing? And what are the probable gap causes from the sources that I'm working with to gather this information? And then what are the cause types? And this one says there's deficiency of um, environmental supports, there's deficiency of knowledge and skills, and there's deficiency of the individual's attributes and values. And something I've added after I did this project was deficiency of the process itself. The process may be faulty, and that's what needs to be fixed. Perhaps it's not a knowledge and skill issue at all. 
All right, so then uh, in the Eli Lilly project, I have 17 different categories of enabling knowledge and skills, but you don't always use all of them. And you can see there are uh, bolder ones and faded out uh, ones here, and we'll cover this in, in greater detail here in just a second. But so I don't use all of them, but I have on occasion, I've done uh, hundreds of these kinds of projects here, and there have been a few projects where I've used every last knowledge and skill category, trying to elicit what are all the enabling knowledge and skills that enable people to be able to perform and meet the standards. And this kind of data goes on what I call a knowledge and skill matrix. And it basically just organizes all of this data and tells you why you need to know active listening and where the heck do you use it? What area of performance, what outputs and tasks do you use active listening on? Because later on, when we're doing training, we're going to want to train people on active listening in that kind of authentic performance and not just some generic educational approach to it. So these are my enabling knowledge and skill categories. A lot of these are just knowledge that people need to have. And then some of these have actual skills, enabling skills that would allow them to use those skills in the performance of tasks while they're trying to produce outputs. My thing is that you derive these based on your documented uh, performance analysis data you don't sit back and just brainstorm these things because then you don't really understand these knowledge and skills in context. And if you're not really going to produce learning and development content that addresses these things in context, you are expecting the learners to take your generic learning and development and then go into trial and error or social learning after your formal learning. And sometimes that might be appropriate, but if it's high stakes performance, it's probably not. So this is the knowledge and skill matrix. We identify, we have a list of knowledge and skill items. We've linked them back to the areas of performance where they are applicable. We identify whether we select people for these, so we don't need to do any training on them or, oh no, we're going to do training on them because people come in and they don't necessarily always have that. Maybe some do but others don't. So there's a training implication there potentially. How, and then we look at how critical is that knowledge and skill item? How difficult is it to learn? Is that content volatile? Does it change all the time? Or is it good since the days of Socrates, you know, active listening, communication skills? And what depth might we take the training to? Do we just need to provide people with a general awareness or deeper knowledge? Or do we actually have to provide them with a skill before we teach them how to use that in task performance to produce outputs. So this again is my fishbone diagram. Um, it's a little bit different than the earlier version of, uh, in, in the format, but it's the same data. So this suggests that learning may not be a solution to the client's performance problem or opportunity. And so, yeah, the answer is exactly. That's why our efforts need to always go beyond asking what people need to do and know. We need to understand what are some of the potential barriers that master performers have likely figured out and they know how to navigate and do their performance despite barriers, despite imperfections in their performance context. And it would be most helpful if we could teach novice performers that to speed them down the learning curve or up the learning curve. Again, this is all about getting analysis data so that we can reach what I call the L&D pivot point. Analysis data that informs the client and stakeholders business decision making to continue with L&D. Or if our data suggests that knowledge and skill deficits aren't at the root, of the problem. And if we were trying to solve a problem with learning and development, perhaps we should forego that, not do that, and pivot to something else, something that the data suggests that maybe we just need to fix the process or the software tools or give people uh, information and data that's current rather than whatever the issue might have been. Or do they need to do both? Now, I've had clients over the years have stopped projects cold right at this point because they realized that the problems that they were trying to address weren't gonna be solved adequately by training. 
And so they needed to pivot and go do something else. And the data that I had produced for them pointed them in the directions for further analysis and development of solutions that would actually solve their problems. But I've had clients who surprised me at times when they said, oh, even though the data shows that training won't solve anything, we like what you've produced and we need this for the new hires that are coming in. And so we're going to do both. We're going to solve these problems. We're going to create some training, some learning. We may have to update that training and learning after we solve these other problems, but it's all good stuff. It's all about performance. In my view, there's four instructional options for us. And it depends on what are the risks and the rewards at stake. There's high uh, stakes performance and there's low stakes performance and medium in between. But when the stakes are low, we might just leave it to informal learning means, trial and error learning, social learning, whatever labels you use for that, but we don't need to create formal content to address that. We'll let people figure it out on their own somehow, some way, because the return on those investments may not make it worthwhile. But so we also need to understand that performance context that I've been talking about. What does the performance context demand or allow? And if it allows a referenced performance response where I can look something up and then perform, perhaps I can just provide standalone job aids or guidance or performance support. Again, many names for the same kind of thing. When I came into the field in 79, they were called job aids, but before that they were called guidance. Soon Gloria Geary came out with electronic performance support systems. And so there's a lot of competing names for that notion of reference materials. Um, and if the stakes are very, very high, maybe I wanna teach people how to use those job aids in training or learning. Um, and again, but, but the performance context allows people to refer to something. But there's times when the performance context demands a memorized performance response because there's no time or it's inappropriate for people to refer to things. If you're on a sales call, you need to know certain things here. You shouldn't be having to look everything up. That, that just doesn't breed confidence with your potential buyers. So we need to do training or learning for memorization or honing critical skills. That's where a learning experience should happen, but otherwise we could be doing performance support and minimize the requirements for people to memorize everything because that's an impossible request for everybody to memorize everything that they need to know on the job. We can provide them with reference materials and that would be better. So we're always looking for when the request comes in, if it's for new hires, well, yeah, sure, we should be expecting a request for new hires, of course. But if the request is to solve a performance problem, we shouldn't expect that, we should suspect it. But nonetheless, we should take the order and conduct a project with analysis that's adequate, that'll help us understand what are the outputs, what are the stakeholder requirements, what are the tasks, what are the stakeholder requirements for that, and what are all the enablers that are necessary especially the enabling knowledge and skills. So this is how this all ties together. We look at the outputs, we look at the stakeholder requirements, our focus is on the knowledge and skill enablers, but we have to be cognizant of all the other enablers that are in that performance context because likely they'll be part of our learning and development efforts. So all about performance competence. This is, it's not all about learning, it's all about performance, even in a learning organization. Now, there's some articles that my uh, business partners and I published back in 1984. This was part of the NSPI journal, now ISPI. And there was a training magazine article we produced also in 1984 on how to conduct these kinds of design efforts using a group process with a team of master performers and other subject matter experts. This is the book that we did in 94. This is a book I just did a couple of years ago in the middle of the pandemic when it was starting, conducting performance-based instructional analysis in every phase of an instructional development effort. Uh, my experience shows me that people will get caught up in analysis paralysis because they're trying to boil the ocean for a cup of tea 
as the quality movement put it back in the 1970s. And they're trying to conduct all of their analysis in one place at one time, rather than spreading it out across their uh, methodology, their, their framework that they use, their addy like framework. Um, so my book addresses, you know, my approach to doing that as a consultant and how I've trained others to do that over the years, my own staff and my clients. This is epi thinking. This is about my fishbone model and some of the other models that uh, go in concert with this. And a uh, more recent book, my latest book is The Cult of Performance in Enterprise L&D. And I, this was a takeoff on Tom Gilbert's Cult of Behaviors. And we needed to not just focus on the enablers such as behaviors or skills or competencies. We needed to really understand them within the context of the outputs, the worthy outputs or accomplishments as he called them and go from there. But we've got to keep our eye on the ends and then understand the means. We shouldn't be just focused on the means because then they're out of context. <laughs>